In this episode, I'm going to populate a dungeon. Not just any dungeon, but one created by the constructs of the mad wizard Xanazir. It's purposed to test those who would dare intrude upon Xanazir's privacy. But its genesis was the will of an artifact who saw sentient organic life forms as inferior. And though Xanazir thought that he controlled this artifact using its powers to make incredible improvements in his clockwork constructions, it was in fact the artifact which subverted the will of Xanazir, sending him in isolation from society, driving off all of his loyal retainers until finally he was surrounded only by his clockwork constructions. And so alone in his laboratory, he would watch those unfortunates as they made their way through his deadly maze. And now, a hundred years later, Xanazir's constructs continue to operate his house of horrors. What terrors await those who would violate his island sanctuary? Well, that's for me and my viewers to decide. Hello again, folks. K.R. King here, helping you homebrew your own campaign. So in the last episode, I asked for help from you, the viewers, uh, for some ideas on creating clockwork monsters, traps, and puzzles for Xanazir's maze. And I got a host of great ideas that I can incorporate both above and below the ground in this episode. You know, one of the best things about having a channel like this is I get a chance to get ideas from other D&D players and GMs. You know, when you're actually playing the game with your friends, uh, it's hard to discuss things because you're coming up with ideas that they're going to run in. So you're always kind of creating an isolation. Yes, you could use books and movies or other campaigns that you've run in, but you don't really get to talk these over. But now with a D&D &D channel, I get ideas from literally all around the world. And ideas come from places you'd never expect. So for example, when I was describing the rooftop where Xanazir's butler construct greets those who come to his island, I mentioned a guest book and said, you know, they could look and see, oh, people who were here 50 years ago or whatever. And I had a viewer, Stephen Collier, who said, wait a minute, why not flesh that out? Why not put some names in that book? And in fact, why not have one with this elaborate script, you know, this sort of John Hancock that might interest the players? And I thought it's a great idea. And I might have uh, that person, you know, leave something down in the maze. Maybe he went down there. Maybe he died there. Maybe he escaped. And Stephen even suggested later on it with the players uh, run into this name in some other totally different context. And they remember him from Xanazir's Maze. It's a great idea. It makes your world seem real. You know, the people move in and out of stories. And I, I hadn't thought about it. And Stephen also keyed in on the idea that the players might just leave Xanazir's Maze. Just get back on the ship. They have a time limit. There's only a limited time when the seas are in such a position they can get to the island. And he mentioned the fact the captain could comment on this, mocking them. Other adventurers, when they return to Dramos, the main city of the campaign, could say, you know, make fun of them, whatever. I had another viewer, Matt Nerdy, who had some great ideas. He had a false door spear trap that I'll talk about later when we get down into the maze. But he had some other ideas as well. He said, like, undead crocodiles. And I'm thinking, well, wait a minute, couldn't they be construct crocodiles? And I'll create a pit trap for that kind of thing. He also talked about the little topies, if you remember. I think they're from Forgotten Realms this kind of demonic little creature. And I thought, well, how about clockwork topies? And in fact, they're going to be like the little cleanup clockworks that scurry out into the corridors to, you know, clean up messes that the players have made or dead bodies or whatever to keep the hallways clean. You know, populating a dungeon is more than just putting in monsters and traps or whatever. It's thinking about why the dungeon was created, its purpose, and how this is reflected in not just its layout, but what's there. You know, I said in an earlier video in terms of storytelling, you want to think like a detective, think backwards from the point at which the players uh, meet something, go back and, and how did it get there and what are its motives and what are its goals. So in this case, you had a maze specifically created by Xanazir and the artifact to test people. So in a way, it's like a contest. And oftentimes, contests are observed, an audience. And here you had an audience of one, Xanazir. So how would he watch groups or groups traveling through the maze? Now, I decided that this was going to be constructed underground. The only way in and out was a teleport. So this means Xanazir is not just watching from above, you know, like a garden maze or whatever. He's watching from a remote location. I'm assuming in his, you know, the study of his home, he has some kind of view screen 
Again, it's all magic. He was 15th to 20th level or, or higher if you want. You can create these devices and not worry about exactly how they work. So this means that there, by some magical means, Xanazir is watching the players and possibly communicating with them. He might be commenting on the action as the groups or individuals or whatever move their way through the maze. He might be mocking them, encouraging them. He might be giving them clues, false clues, whatever. He is a presence as the players are traveling through. So if when the players go through this maze and they hear Xanazir's voice, they're like, wait a minute, is he still alive? Is he actually watching us from his house? Because remember, I set it up so it's very difficult to get into the house before you go through the maze. Or is it a recording of Xanazir and you might you know, give hints to this if you have the same set of comments that he makes, right? Almost like a video game where there's only a limited number of phrases. I used to be an adventurer like you. Then I took an arrow in the knee. Or is the artifact itself imitating Xanazir? And this is revealed when the players get close to the exit and the artifact starts to get concerned. Does it begin to use its real voice? You know, this sort of thing. So when we're thinking about the players entering this dungeon, we know that it's created as a a uh, maze to test the players. What do they see in this, the entrance, which in this case is the center of the maze? So, you know, what is the lighting source? I'm thinking that I'm gonna have artificial lighting. You know, Xanazir wants to see everything that's going on, so it's very well lit. You know, magic sconces, say every 20 feet or something like that, so it's brightly lit. Uh, the walls and floors, I'm thinking it's gonna be something unique. You know, you usually think of cut stone or something, but what about smooth metallic surfaces? And what about if you put your fingers on the walls, you get a slight electrical charge, not enough to do any damage, but to tell you that this whole place is imbued with some kind of electrical energy, the energy that supplies the power to the constructs. Now, when they come to this first room, they're gonna be in a teleport circle that corresponds to the one on the roof. Now, is it a raised dais or is it in the floor? Another thing to think about, because you don't see this from a two-dimensional view, is how high is the ceiling? 10 feet, 20, whatever, you can vary the height of the ceiling. You can have sections of the maze with a 40 foot ceiling. And then you can have flying clockworks that come and attack the players. So the players are in this initial room. They see, you know, we're here. There's there's three exits, as you can see on this map. You know, they've heard Xanazir welcoming them to his maze, hoping that they will survive. So I'm just gonna go in one direction here and give some examples of some encounters, traps, puzzles, riddles, that kind of thing that you can then use throughout this maze. Because there's there's 17 big dead ends here and the exit. And then these little minor dead ends. Again, I found this on the internet. I just took what I had. I was trying to keep it simple. So I'm going to leave from this northern exit. I'm using fantasy grounds. I'm scaling this so that the corridors are 10 feet wide, two five foot squares. And then if we switch over, we can see the player's perspective where they can only see as they go forward. As we go up here, you know, moving six squares per turn, as you can see, they're halfway down this first corridor. Now, again, do you want to have some kind of a trap or surprise thing? Do you want to just have exclusively when they come to dead ends, that's where they have encounters? So let's say that I want to establish early, hey, this maze has some deadly traps in it. Maybe I'll use Matt Nerdy's false door spear trap as an example. You know, this reminds me of an old trap in Gary Gygax's legendary Tomb of Horrors. So they're going to see along the wall the you know, outline of a door with a little handle, right? And again, if you're going to block off certain areas, certain dead ends with doorways, which is an idea, you can all have them the same way. There's this sort of inset so that it doesn't look any different than any other door they might run into. So Matt gives stats on the door in case the players try to break it down instead of opening it. Maybe they do a perception check. There's a trap on the door handle. He allows it to be broken down, but now when the spear attacks with its plus five to hit, it does so at advantage. And Matt gives us some stats on if you've got thieves tools and whatnot to disarm the trap. Uh, he also has poison. Again, if the players are able to quickly uh, remove that poison state, you might want to use that. I might avoid that, if, if, especially if it's the first encounter. But again, they, you might be telling them, hey, this is nasty. So good work, Matt. All right, so the players move here and now we get a fork. Uh, they can go in this direction, which eventually will lead to a dead end here or they can go over to this direction, which will also lead into dead end. This is not going to take them to the end of the maze. Eventually, if they go on this northern route, they're gonna to have to turn back around, go to the main room and take another route. Now you do have these little slight uh, dead ends. Again, this was just found on the internet. You can use these as informational sort of things, you know, murals or something that tells them things to look for, signs on the walls, this sort of thing that tells them they're going on the right path. You might also have a riddle. 
And I'm going to give a link to some riddle sites because, again, I don't like to think them up. Uh, I found this one. It's a classic riddle, right? So what you'd have is a mural on the wall, and you have three characters uh, maybe identified, you know, paladin, cleric, and druid. And they all have blue war paint on their faces, and they're blindfolded. And behind them is a blue sky with a sun, and the sun is a little bit obscured by clouds. And the voice of Xanazir comes on and he says, I hope you like my picture. If you can answer my riddle correctly, you will be rewarded, but wrong and you shall be punished. And so then he says, I am an eye set in a blue face. My gaze feeds the world, but if I should go blind, so too does the world. So then the players look at this, they talk amongst themselves. If they pick someone to answer the question, let's say they pick Cleric. He's the one with his, you know, spiritual thing. And Xanazir says, is that your final answer? And if they say yes, and the answer to this riddle is the sun, right? The sun feeds the world, whatnot. It's not one of these humans, right? If they answer incorrectly, you could do something like, uh, you know, 2d6 radiant damage to the group. You know, they get a con save. You can make it a DC 12 if you want, not too difficult, half damage. If they answer correctly and say sun, you can do 2d6 radiant healing to everyone. Now, uh, if this is in this initial room here, uh, this initial thing, and they haven't done any damage, you can have a little thing open up and there's a scroll, radiant heal. Again, 2d6. You know, I put a link to some other puzzles. Again, this is reflects Xanazir. This is one of those instances where these kind of puzzles and riddles and things make sense. So when the players come to a true dead end is where you can set up a monster, clockwork monster encounter. Uh, again, they're going to have to retrace their steps. So I had an idea. Matt Nerdy had suggested a crocodile. What if when the players come through here, they go to this section, they look around, nothing going on. Maybe there's a statue there they have to come up and look at, but it doesn't give them any information. When they turn back around, this section of the <clears throat> corridor has collapsed and there's a pool 10 to 20 feet deep. Guess what? There's two clockwork crocodiles with a sloping floor here so that they can climb out to attack the players. And you modify if a clockwork, you know, I think a crocodile natural AC is 12, you could make it 16. You could also make it uh, resistant to, you know, piercing or uh, slashing non-magical weapons, but then you could make it uh, vulnerable to, say, electrical damage, uh, bludgeoning damage, something like that. So you have this battle, not too tough, you know, if you look at the standard stats on a uh, crocodile, you know, they're going to handle it, again, if they're 5th, 6th level, which is what I'm imagining these characters are for this encounter. Going to do a little bit of damage, possibly. But they're also going to learn something about the constructs in terms of their capabilities, why when the metal, they have a much better armor class, again, uh, what they're resistant to and vulnerable to. You could also put something in the pool, say a gem, that the players can use later, maybe to fit into a statue at some later point, something where they, you know, a wall that they have to get through. Don't make it something that's absolutely critical, because if the players don't look into the pool, you know, the water's murky or whatever, unless they can just see it down there easily, and they bypass it, now they've got to get back and find the thing, and it's a big pain in the ass. Again, again, maybe they'll get a hint later on to go back to the crocodile pool and get the gem, but again, make sure it's not necessarily critical. Now, an important point here, too. If the players are unhindered, they're going to find their way through the maze. Because all they have to do is just travel through every corridor. When they come to a dead end, they just backtrack. They're going to be mapping this. You know, we're going to do this electronically on Fantasy Ground, so there will the map will be. And finally, they will find their way to the teleport exit, and they can escape. Unless there is some special device uh, that they have to use to, you know, exit through the teleport thing that perhaps they haven't found yet. Obviously, if the monsters and traps are too much and the party is killed, they're not going to get through. And also, if you set up barriers on the way, they have to get through doorways, gates, this kind of thing. And if they don't, they can't get to the exit. Now, as I've said before, I don't like to create encounters in which the entire party can get killed off. I usually like to think of some kind of out, especially if the players are creative, in which one or two characters may die, maybe even die-die. But there's always an opportunity for them to escape, even if it's a very painful escape. You know, and in a similar fashion, if you've set up a barrier that the players have to get by or a puzzle they have to solve or some item that they have to get a hold of and they just can't find it and they're stuck, you're going to need to come up with some way to give a hint or some kind of help because you don't want them to just, they just can't figure it out. You know, do something creative, especially if they think of something and kind of help them along. 
Now, when the players make their way through the maze, once they've succeeded, you know, they've defeated all the creatures or whatever, made it out, they're going to want some reward. And I'm thinking that they will be teleported from the maze teleport into the teleport chamber beneath Xanazir's library. They then go up, there's items there or something. If you want to have them fight the Guardian Construct, I don't think so because it's a very tough thing. Once they get in there and made it through the maze, there'll be some device that'll turn it off. Maybe they can even take control of it. So this leads to a wrinkle that I'm going to add uh, that can get you out of potential total party kills or the, the party being totally, we, we're stuck, we don't know what to do. So this comes from another subscriber, Squams, who suggested that the house itself has some sentience. It's created, in, uh, the house as an automaton itself. Uh, it would have like furniture and seemingly harmless things that are in fact clockwork type constructions that could attack the players. I love this idea. It also leads into something that I think could not only, as I say, get the players out of some tricky situation, but make this encounter have a life that goes beyond just this uh, one thing. Because there is a general principle that nothing is static, right? Things change, right? Nature changes. You know, it, it hates a st static state. And also ideas and thoughts change. Why shouldn't a situation, even if imbued with magic, change? You know, think of Hegel's ideas. Again, I'm not a Hegelian. I'm just pointing this out where he talks about the history of human ideas, the human spirit or mind or whatever. It's constantly changing and evolving. You know, he says it's going towards freedom or whatever, whatever it is. Well, why would these clockworks sitting in here running this clockwork maze over a hundred years, what if they begin to change? What if there's a spark in some of these clockworks of some form of self-consciousness? What if they only need a catalyst, say the player characters, to make that spark find fruition. And what can happen is you can have, let's say there's these little topies that Matt Nerdy suggested running around scurrying about, and again they're clockworks, and when they see the players or they're observing the players and the players get stuck or something happens, I mean if the players are taking a long rest, maybe they, they wake up or they, they see someone has slipped out a note or some information that warning them that the artifact means to destroy them or something. And what happens here is not only would this potentially if they give them a clue, go to this passageway, look for the portrait of the man with the cane and, you know, put the jewel in it, you know, whatever the puzzle is that allows the players to get through something. Once they're done with this, what happens? Now these clockworks, it's kind of a new life form. You know, and then the clock, clockworks may have ideas of their own. Perhaps the guardian construct wants to go on its own or maybe it wants to travel with the players. I don't know. But you've got a great thing for new storylines. Now, I just touched on that one section of hallway to give you, I gave you an idea of a, you know, a puzzle and a trap and a clockwork monster. 17 dead ends. There's many more ideas that you can think of. And thanks again to my viewers, Matt Nerdy, Stephen Colley, and Squams for their great ideas. If you like what you've seen, please subscribe to my channel. I'm always looking for more. Leave some comments. I love to hear them and I answer them all. But of course, most importantly, my friends, keep playing D&D and tell somebody else about it.